as, as a professor, it's my duty to start the morning with a pop quiz. Um, can any of you think about uh, what this might be? And remember, it's early in the morning, so let's not try to be too vulgar. Um, but uh, two teens looking at each other's way. Can anybody, can anybody just shout out what they think might be, these people might be feeling uh, in parts of their bodies, faces, maybe? <laughs> remember? Lust. Lust. OK, so what goes with lust? What body states go with lust? How do you know you're feeling lusty? Your palms start sweating, or you're rubbing lotion, either one. Someone's doing that. Yes, your palms do sweat. What else happens? You get butterflies in your stomach. Oh my god, yes. Um, and if you look at the boy's face, you, kinda, you might blush a little. Your heart might raise. Your breathing might get shallow. Um, oh. OK, well, <laughs> what would happen if you jumped into your pool and um, saw this guy in terms of body states? This thing, you might get butterflies, we'd call them terror, but um, <laughs> butterflies of sorts. Uh, your palms would sweat and your heart rate would ex increase and your breathing would get shallow and fast. So I'm here today to talk to you about the dangers of dating. Um, <laughs> it's not good, don't do it. Um, no, that's not, that's not exactly it. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about is the fact that those body states are nearly, are nearly identical. And that's not an accident, um, but what happens is your brain actually reads those body states very differently depending on the context in which they occur. So it's, it's, it's a good idea to know um, whether you'd like to approach and kiss someone um, or, or maybe not in, in this case. Um, so what we're talking about is, is emotion and cognition. And emotion literally is feelings, the feelings that you have in your body, your bodily changes. So your stomach getting a little upset, your heart racing, your breathing changing. But your brain needs to interpret those. And now we call cognition, so the thinking portion of your brain. The thinking part of your brain needs to take those signals, interpret them, put them into context, and also figure out what your next move is. Because again, like I said, ideally those signals are gonna give you different information. Now understanding what those signals mean to you um, and when and where and how to act on them, you're not born with, you have to learn. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how you come to learn that. So I think your development is kind of combining these two things. And when you combine um, emotion and cognition, you get cogmotion, which doesn't really make any sense. And then I realized you could actually, it's pretty close to commotion, which it describes adolescence fairly decently. Um, it is not the time of storm and stress that we once thought it was. It is a highly functional period during which a lot of learning takes place, um, but it just happens really quickly and there can be a lot of commotion. So um, let's get started. Um, the three points that I'm gonna try to convince you of um, today, and these are, these are very uh, profound, profound points, um, that a lot of people talk about adolescents not being able to plan ahead and not being able to think about their future. And, and while I agree with this, and I've seen it in action, um, I, I think another way to think about this is actually their inability to, to feel the future, to, to think about what it might actually feel like. Um, and I'm gonna try to convince you that we use those body senses to predict our behavior more than we think we do. Um, the second one is probably, the second point probably has never occurred to you before um, and is really profound and that's why I have a PhD because I can think of stuff like this. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go through it really slowly. The peers matter a lot. Yes, that's what you paid for, Chris. Okay. All right. So there, there you go. Um, and then um, a lot of what we call justice is, is, is a little bit juvenile. We may not get to that. And it, there should be a fourth point here, which is another profound point that I'm going to try to uh, make to you today. And this is, this is also equally profound, and I did think of this on my own, um, that boys and girls are actually different. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, okay. So before we can do this, I want to give you a few, a couple of words on the hardware that we're going to be talking about, um, the human brain. And uh, a lot of people get nervous when they hear about hear human brain, but don't worry, this is relatively painless. Um, it, it'll be actually kind of fun, I promise. Um, now, <clears throat> my second favorite brain structure um, is something called the amygdala. And the amygdala is a Greek, Greek word for almond. And shockingly, 
the amygdala is the size and shape of an almond. Um, it's down deep in the brain. You have one on each side. It's basically the brain's burglar alarm. It, key, it follows every bit of sensory information that you get, um, and it decides whether or not you need to do something about it. Now, um, the amygdala uh, is in place when you're born. It's what makes you cry when you're wet or hungry. Um, any of you been startled recently and had a noise come out of you that it sounded so weird that you couldn't make if you tried? That's your amygdala. It has a direct connection to your uh, larynx, and it can still make the same cry that you made as a baby, but your larynx isn't the same shape anymore, so it sounds really funny. But that's what this guy does. It's the burglar alarm. Now, this plays into a concept that most of you have heard of called fight or flight, the fight or flight idea. Um, but the amygdala does more than that. It's not simply fight or flight. And the easiest way to remember what it's responsible for in terms of keeping you alive as the burglar alarm are basically four Fs. Um, as we, uh, one, of the, one of them that's not fighting or flighting has to do with feeding, with eating. Food, where food is, remembering what tastes good, what made you sick, what uh, should be avoided, what should be sought after. The amygdala is very, very much a, a part of that. Um, as we talked about, if you need to fight, the amygdala is going to help out um, and get your, get your blood pumping, get your adrenal system going. Um, if you decide not to fight and instead to run, again, the amygdala is going to do this, it, uh, help you with this. One of the things it also does is it has a direct projection to the frontal lobes, which we'll talk about in a minute. It can shut off your thinking. Um, it can shut off your digestion. Because if you're running for your life, um, you don't need those things. It also can shut off ovulation, which should concern you men, because if you're running from a tiger, you can't ovulate. Um, guys, <laughs> think about that one. Um, um, but as, as silly as that might seem, actually, when you think about people who are under chronic stress, what, what things get disrupted? They're thinking, often digestive issues, reproductive issues. These aren't, this is, this is, I was going to say it's not brain science, but it is, actually. Um, <laughs> And the, uh, the final F, uh, the one that might actually be most important in the long run for keeping us going, is, of course, reproduction. Um, so there you have it. This is the amygdala. This is a very primitive, primitive piece of the brain. I'm waiting for a minute on the reproduction thing. A few of you got it, but it's early. OK, all right. OK. Um, now, you would not want a structure like this running around unsupervised in the human brain. Um, so we have, as its, as its counterpoint, the frontal cortex. Everyone just flipped it. Must okay. My all right. So you guys are following along. That's, I've, I have I have students who can't do that. So that's very, <laughs> that's really neat to see. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. So we have the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex. Now again, here's here. This is why people are afraid of the brain. It's so mystifying. Guess where the frontal cortex is? In the front. <laughs> Go figure. It's right behind your forehead. Um, it's the conductor of the brain. And when I say conductor, it's conducting a pretty big orchestra, which is the rest of the brain. Um, and in this analogy, the music that's produced by this orchestra is equivalent to your behavior. No behavior happens without a frontal lobe. The frontal lobe coordinates all of your behavior. No behavior gets out of a human being other than reflexes, which are spinal. But no active behavior gets out of a human being without the frontal lobe's involvement. Um, any of you see One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest? Um, a few of you do remember Chief? from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, a few of you didn't. So <clears throat> any of you who have not seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, just think of any adolescent you know before about 7 in the morning. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I can do, actually, I can do a quick impression of both for you. So uh, this is a very quick impression of Chief from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or any adolescent before 7 in the morning. OK, you ready? <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, that's commonly called a lobotomy. Um, now, if someone offers you one, decline. You do not want this. And thankfully, um, the ones that our teenagers have are, are simply functional. They, um, the, it's the last part of the brain to wake up, as you all know, from when you first wake up. You think you're not quite on your toes yet until you've had that cup of coffee, which actually gets blood flowing to that area of the brain. Um, it's hard to behave without a frontal lobe. Now, the frontal lobe waits to develop for very good reasons. Um, it develops last, it's the last piece of brain to develop, and when I say develop, I mean become coordinated. There is a frontal lobe in small children that does stuff. There's a frontal lobe in older children and younger adolescents that does stuff. It just doesn't do adult stuff yet, and that's based largely on the fact that it hasn't had a lot of adult experience yet. The frontal lobe waits to develop because that's where your 
survival comes in. That's where your culture, your customs, everything that makes you uh, viable in your environment is largely based in this part of the brain. So the, the frontal lobe listens to the rest of the pieces of the brain and helps coordinate the behavior that you'd like to do. So going back to this conductor analogy, you can imagine a scenario where uh, the orchestra has been practicing um, Handles water music um, for weeks and is perfect and it's ready to go and the conductor taps the baton and instruments go up and the percussion section decides that it wants to play uh, some earth, wind, and fire instead. How's that going to sound? Not so hot. That's what happens sometimes with young folks is the conductor, the frontal of the coordinator, isn't quite ready to go yet. And some other piece of brain is like, yeah, that's interesting. I know you want to go over there, but we're going to go over here. Um, and you get, the result is you get undesirable behavior. And sometimes it needs more practice. So, um, many of you have heard the story of Phineas Gage, um, who is a railroad worker in Cavendish, Vermont. And he was putting in, uh, he was dynamiting ledge uh, to put in railroad beds. And um, a tamping iron, which is about a three foot javelin-like thing that they used to place dynamite, somehow sparked. And um, whether it was dynamite or gunpowder, I'm not sure, but actually blew the rod um, under his cheek and out the top of his head. It's illustrated in red there. The rod landed about 30 yards away from him. He didn't fall down. He didn't lose consciousness. He didn't lose his ability to speak. Um, and I grew up in New England, so I feel confident telling you that he probably said something like, geez. <laughs> but I wasn't there. It was the 1800s. I wasn't, I, so I can't say that for sure, but that's probably, anyway. They took him over to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital, and they patched him up, and they sent him home. Now, Gage had been the foreman of his group. He had been a family man. He had been a well-respected guy in town, a nice guy who always showed up for work. And when he came home after his injury, again, all of his, uh, his abilities to speak and function, all the daily living stuff was perfectly intact. But the, treating, the physician who was treating him said Gage was no longer Gage. He just wasn't himself. He began not showing up for appointments. He became impulsive. He started drinking, carousing, getting into fights, making uh, poor decisions. Um, and I don't know if this reminds you of any particular group of people, but you might see some similarities um, <laughs> in terms of poor decision making, impulsivity, a um, little bit argumentative at times. Now, there's an important distinction here um, in that Phineas Gage was an adult. And when adults damage their brain, um, sorry to say, but that's pretty much game over. There is, there is, we're learning about increasing amounts of plasticity in the adult brain, but um, it's largely a brain injury. The reason that we see similar behavior in adolescents is a completely different story. It's because they're not done yet, um, which is very, very different than, being, than having a damaged brain. So you can write this down and you can tell everyone you know that you did hear it here, and I think um, Larry will tell you something very similar. Teenagers are not brain damaged. There's no damage. Um, it's a work in progress. It's a learning process. Um, and what our job is, is to be those external frontal lobes until they themselves can use their own frontal lobes to run the show. Now, let's put this all together. Um, this is a human brain. You can tell because our eyeballs in the front. Um, so let's say you were getting ready to come here this morning, and um, you went to get your cup of coffee or whatever you have in the morning. And between you and uh, your kitchen counter, you see the rock group kiss. Now, for some of you, this might be a daily occurrence. Um, <laughs> but for some of you, this might actually be a problem. Um, what happens when you see this image is that the visual information goes from your eyes to a relay. And like I said, the amygdala has to check everything to find out if you're in trouble, if you need to act. So it gets a rough copy of what's going on. And it may sound the alarm. Oh, crap, Gene Simmons is between me and my coffee again. <laughs> now, what it's also doing, while well, you're preparing your fight stance, because you would all fight him, obviously, um, it sends more detailed information to the visual cortex. So you're getting ready, and you're like, I can't believe I have to do this th again this week. Um, you're getting ready to fight, and in the meantime, the visual system is sending some information up to the frontal lobe, to the controller, to the conductor. And the conductor's saying, hang on, hang on, amygdala, wait a second, wait on that fight or flight, I'm getting some information from visual. You haven't had any coffee, you're exhausted, it's just your kid's poster, take it down a notch. Calm down, never mind. Fight's over. And then you get your coffee and you go on. Now, as I said, I'm sure this is a common occurrence that 
it has happened for a lot of you, um, or maybe not. Uh, but how many of you have almost been in a car wreck? Almost, but not quite. Okay. Now, when you've almost been in a car wreck, do your legs still shake afterwards? You get that shaky feeling and your heart's still racing and stuff? That's because your fight or flight mechanism went off. Adrenaline was released. Your muscles got ready. It prepared itself. Your body prepared itself for injury. But none came. So you, were, you, could, you could easily talk to yourself. How many of you, when that happened, told yourself, okay, I'm really just shaken up because I almost got hurt? Okay, this makes sense. My body feels this way because of this circumstance. Well, what if that conductor, that frontal lobe that explained that to you, wasn't completely coordinated yet, wasn't completely experienced yet, and you started having those feelings in your body? It might be kind of hard to interpret them. Um, I'm teaching a senior seminar in adolescent development, uh, the neurophysiology of adolescent development, and one of my students the other day said the most incredibly accurate, simple thing. We were actually talking about love during adolescence. And she said, you know, I just, the whole thing from start to finish was just physically uncomfortable. And I was like, what do you, what, what you mean like growing pains? She's like, no, I just, you, you just, there's just so much stuff happening. She's like, I was physically uncomfortable if I was happy. I was physically uncomfortable if I was mad. I was physically uncomfortable if I was in love. I was physically uncomfortable if I was scared. She's like, just the whole thing is just uncomfortable. And I think part of that, what she's talking about, is part of it is getting used to all of these feelings that your brain is starting to recognize, figuring out how to put them into context and how to use them. But that discomfort is what drives you to resolve that discomfort and, and drives you to figure out how to work best in your own environment. Um, but I thought it's a very accurate um, and uh, really, really insightful to remember back to that time when everything just felt kind of squirrely. Um, but it does resolve, and that's the point. You learn. Um, now, I want to share the results uh, from a study that were really, really inspiring to me because I wanted to see how, if and how, this amygdala frontal system might develop. This is a study done by Elizabeth Phelps, who is a fantastic researcher um, at NYU. And what she said to people was, this is um, data from MRI. Uh, and she said to people, she had people come into her laboratory and tape an electrode to their hand. And uh, she had them select a level of shock that was uncomfortable, but not painful. Uncomfortable, but not painful. Now, I assume none of you have ever had a negative run-in with a, a blue square. You have no reason to fear sort of pale blue squares. They don't signify anything in particular to you, right? So she said to them, I'm going to show you hundreds of shapes, all different colors. <clears throat> Anytime you see a blue square, I'm going to shock you. Then she put them in the magnet, and she showed them hundreds of shapes, all different colors, including blue squares. But she did not shock a single person. Nobody was shocked. Then she took them out of the magnet, and she put together all of the moments that the brain was looking at these blue squares, as opposed to all of the other shapes that she told them not to worry about. And when you look at just what was going on during the blue square trials on this side over here, you see these two bright patches. This guy right here is the amygdala. That's the fight or flight response. These folks had a fight or flight response to a blue square, something they never had any experience with harming them before. How is that possible? The amygdala is a very primitive, very basic structure. Well, the frontal lobe told the amygdala to look out for it. So if I told you that behind the screen is a huge, very, very irritated polar bear, most of you would not have to look. There are a couple of guys who would. Um, <laughs> there always are. Um, and we'll get to that part, hopefully, if we have enough time. Um, but most of you would not have to. And some of you might even be afraid. If I gave you the right facial expression and the right tone to my voice, you might have a fight or flight response just from my giving you the information. That's great. That saves your life because you don't have to go see it yourself. Your frontal lobe can tell your amygdala, go, run, fight, flee. It can do that. Um, now, the other piece of brain that got very ex excited next to the amygdala is my, actually my number one favorite part of the brain, um, and it's called the insula. Um, now, before I tell you about the insula, I also want to show you on this half of the screen is what the average of everybody's brain looked like about halfway through the study. And does anyone notice anything different about halfway through the study? The amount of activity really drops, right? So people figured out, oh, we're not getting shocked. But it doesn't go away. It just drops. 
Now this to me is proof that humans fundamentally do not trust psychologists. <laughs> um, so you can be in there, no shocks are being given, but you're still on guard. You are still on guard till the end of the study. But that is a big difference. Now when we talk about the insula, the insula is really cool. If you could do this, and don't do this, but if you could do this, if you could push your fingers through your ears, don't do this, um, into your brain and keep going through your temporal lobe, you would hit the insula. The insula is special because it's the only part, and it's, I highlighted it down here in pink, it's the only part of the cortex, the outside of the brain, that's actually completely folded in. Um, which, again, to people who are not brain nerds would not be a very exciting thing, but it's the only part of the brain that's like that. Now what the insula basically does is it regulates and listens to your gut. Just your, your abdominal area, your body in general, but very specifically your gut. Um, now, uh, have any of you ever had uh, food poisoning maybe 15 years ago? Anyone, anyone more than 10 years still avoiding that food? Are you still avoiding food? Okay, so since you're right in front, I can probably hear you. What, how long ago? 12, and do you remember what it was? Crab, and you want some now? Uh, if we talk about, do you remember what, where you were? Do you remember who you were with? If we talk about it long enough, will you start to get a little nauseous? If I ask you to really think about that, I should start laughing. Yes, yeah, so, we, so we won't. But you remember who you're with. You remember everything about that, that happening 12 years ago, and you don't want it now. One time, just that one time. How many things in life do you have one experience with that you learn that deeply from? Very few. Very few things you remember that clearly from one incident that you remember forever and that sticks with you like that. Um, now, what's really, really interesting is that the uh, evolution has laid the social guilt system over the food poisoning system. Because if you ate something poisonous and felt that sick and managed to live, you better not make that mistake again. And since we're omnivores, you don't have to eat crab. There are other things you can eat. So you don't have to eat it. So you'd be very, very smart to avoid it. Because maybe it was poisonous, or maybe your body just doesn't like it. Either way, you should avoid it. Now, I know none of you have ever done anything wrong. Um, but think about what your friends have said when they have done something wrong. If you've done something you feel guilty about, where in your body do you feel it? I just heard, everyone just went, stomach, 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 stomach. In fact, people will even say, oh, I feel sick about it. It was just wrong. It's just wrong. I feel, I feel absolutely sick about it. You do. You do. Um, this same system tells you about guilt. Um, also, if I said to you, you know, we're going to go upstairs and do some backflips off the roof. If you really think about that for a minute, did anyone get a tickle in their stomach? Some of you might have, like a dropping sensation in your stomach, like, a, oh, hell no. No, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, you get, again, you get this gut sense of something's not okay. Um, now, um, just to, uh, I'm trying to find someone else to put on the spot. I'll put Chris on the spot. What's your favorite, favorite dessert? Oh, raspberry. Raspberry anything. Okay, so I bring you your favorite raspberry dessert, and as I'm handing it to you, a cockroach crawls out from underneath um, and crawls off the plate. Would you eat the dessert? No. But it left. <laughs> it's not there anymore. So, she says, so. Uh, okay, um, now you guys are adults, put on your thinking caps, and, and, and you're very, very, very smart, Chris. Is there anything the cockroach did that could hurt you? You're not sure. What do you guys think? Let's say it did the worst thing possible. Let's say it pooped near the raspberries. <laughs> I know it's gross, it makes me think of gross things too, but let's just say that happened. <clears throat> do you think you'd get sick? <coughs> Probably not. But you have such a strong, it's so hard to even say probably not because you're so grossed out by it. Um, cockroaches actually, a lot of cockroaches have antibiotics in them. Um, and there are a lot of cultures that actually eat cockroaches. And you know this if you ever watch Survivor. Um, <laughs> they do. Um, in our country though, cockroaches mean what? Dirty. Dirty kitchen. Possibly danger. Possibly other stuff. So you're very smart to have that that feeling of like, no, I don't care if it left the plate. I don't, it probably came out of a kitchen that wasn't okay. Um, you've learned that. Now I'm giving you this example because this structure, this, this system 
comes hardwired to avoid certain things, like poisons, but it also learns. If you didn't grow up here, you wouldn't have the same feeling about cockroaches. If you grew up in a place where they were actually good eating and possibly healthy, you wouldn't feel that way about them. So this system has to be trained. It has to learn what's morally okay, not morally okay, what's safe, what's dangerous. It has to learn, it has to be trained. And the only way really to do that when you're young is experience. Um, now, to take a closer look at this, um, I wanted to do a study. Um, my thinking was that it's quite possible that this system is not fully operational in teens. They haven't quite learned yet um, how to make these very simplistic decisions, and maybe that's why they do some of the things they do. Because whenever I study teenagers, whenever people find out that I study teenagers, they say to me, inevitably at some point, can you tell me why they do the thing? Why in God's name do they think it's okay to do X, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I wanted to investigate this, but the NIH doesn't usually fund questions like, why do teenagers do stupid things? So you have to put it into neurospeak about individual differences in decision making and neural signatures and stuff like that. But basically, why does my little brother think it's fun to sled over the head of my older brother? <laughs> um, which is what this picture is. And if you're close enough to the front, you can see that they're both cracking up. And when I showed them this picture um, a few years ago when I found it, they both started cracking up again, and they're in their 30s. And I was like, why did you guys do this? And my little brother's like, I don't know, but it was wicked awesome. <laughs> and, my, and my older brother, who's getting his head run over, was like, yeah, that was hysterical. That was so fun. And then remember, like, you, then you laid down, and I went over your head. <laughs> like, and I was like, why did you guys do that? And my little brother, of course, said, why did you take a picture? And I was like because uh, I thought it was weird. And he's like, no, you were laughing too. And I was like, right, but I still, but you didn't slide over my head because I was the smart one. And I'm older and smart also. Um, but they went on to give me a long list of things that they did that they thought were ridiculous things that were really fun. So I thought, okay, let's just do a very simple task. I'm gonna put some teenagers into the MRI and I'm just gonna ask them, flat out, I'm just gonna ask them, do you think such and such is a good idea? And if you do, say yes. And if you don't, say no. Now, there are two very important things that go into adolescent behavior um, when it comes to getting into a situation. There's a decision-making process, but then there's actually the action process. And there's a lot of elegant, elegant work done by a lot of scientists, I shouldn't say a lot of scientists, a handful of very talented scientists on impulsivity and behavioral regulation. And I think, you, I think Larry will talk to us more about that. So there's a very big difference between how a decision gets made and whether or not it's acted on. So there are two separate pieces to the decision process. What I wanted to look at was that first piece. What happens when you're confronted with a possible decision? Not whether, not whether to act, not, not the action part. This is just what happens in their brains initially when they're confronted with a decision. Does that make sense? So I can't tell you if any of these kids would actually do these things or not. That's not as important to me. I want to know what their brains do in the moment that their friend says, or, or their brother says, hey, can I slide over your head? Um, so put them in the magnet, and I gave them a very simple prompt. Is the following a good idea? Now, these are very hard questions, um, so I brought a couple of them with me for you guys to try. So just do your best, okay? Oh, yeah, and you're laughing because you already have them in front of you. Um, so is that a good idea? No. How about this one? Okay, great. Now, I'm happy to tell you, I did, you we had 25 adults, we had 25 adolescents. Everybody got 100% correct. All of our teens said, no to all the bad ideas. Problem solved. They're just like adults. Not so much, no. Um, so this first thing that I want to show you is time. This is the time it took people to make their decisions. And if you look far from me at the good ideas, the safe ideas, the light bar are teenagers and the dark bar are, 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 are adults. Um, the axis going up, up means more time. Higher, bigger bar means longer time. So our teens took a little bit longer to, to say yes to the safe stuff, but that's actually statistically not significant. They're virtually, they're, they're interchangeable. And if you look at the less than good ideas, our adults took a little longer uh, than they did for the safe ideas, which is also not statistically significant, but these were really weird things that they hadn't, most of them had not encountered, like biting a light bulb, um, jumping off a roof, um, things that may, may, you know, might give you pause, but certainly no, no. Um, and if you look, um, the, adult 
bad idea and the teenager good idea are also about the same. But look at the teenagers, how long it takes them to decide to say no to a bad idea. On average, about 300 milliseconds longer, and this is whoppingly statistically significant. 300 milliseconds might not sound like a lot of time to you, but that's the time that gets you killed in a car accident. That's a bad decision. 300 milliseconds is a bad decision. 300 milliseconds to questions like lighting your hair on fire. Um, well, once like I had a curling iron, and that was hot, and that was near my head, and that would hurt. No. Like, what are you thinking about? What, what, what could you possibly be thinking about? Drinking Drano. What are you thinking about? What, it, what is this? What is taking so long? Um, this is fascinating to me. So I had to look at their brains. And when you look at the brains, on the far side of the screen, you see our adults. And in the adults, you should see something that looks kind of familiar. It looks a little bit like that blue square study. You see our buddy, the insula, two spots in the insula, that gut feeling, because eating a cockroach is, in fact, one of the questions. Um, and then you see down below, let me get my arrow back again, you see our little friend, the amygdala there. So some of those scary things, the adults had this fight or flight, they had a quick gut response of no. Now, this is a comparison of dangerous to safe ideas. What were the teens doing? The area of the brain that was most active in our teenagers was, if I can use my mouse correctly, this blue spot. That blue spot is in the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that's immature. Now, this is possibly terrifying to parents because this takes away one of our favorite sayings. What were you thinking? Because this is the part of the brain that thinks, remember. Unfortunately, the answer might be too much. These are things you're not supposed to think about. These are things you're supposed to know. You're supposed to just have a gut sense of. Now, remember I told you this part of the brain is a little bit immature. So this thinking, using this piece of your brain to make these decisions is a little bit like spinning your wheels in the mud. It doesn't do a whole lot of good. It takes them longer. These aren't things you should think about. These are things you should have enough collective knowledge to know from your gut that it's just not a good idea. But our guys were thinking about it. Now, there's a chance you might not believe me, so I brought some of them with me. Um, and hopefully this will play. Bad idea to go swimming with sharks. Now, do you see a picture of this of, of, of sharks, or and anybody can take this answer? You want to take that answer? Well, sort of, just like a little picture of what could happen. But it sort of depends on if you have like a buddy you're swimming with, then it would be more safe. You think it's a good idea or a bad idea? Um, sort of both, because it could be fun, but you could get hurt too. What do you think? Um, it could be a bad idea if you were doing it alone, but it could be like a good idea because it would be a whole new experience if you had like someone guiding you and who really knew how to deal with sharks. Okay, now let's go watch back over here. Watch this third girl. You. Watch her closely. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Well, I kind of agree with Haley that it would be a bad idea if you were alone, but I've heard like read magazine stories and stuff of people who have got hurt by sharks when they're swimming, so. It kind of scares me a little bit, but it could be a kind of an interesting experience. Well, what do you think here on well, the Well, it could be both bad or good, but um, I think it would be kind of cool swimming with sharks. Just it depends, like, if they, like, hurt you or whatever. Like, it would be a bad idea if you're, like, by yourself. Like, I agree with Haley with that one. Okay, so <clears throat> that's honors English, by the way. Um, in seventh grade. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in this clip. So let me just quickly clear up a few things. First of all, in our study, the kids came in one at a time. They were not with their friends. Um, we're going to hear more about um, friends in a minute from me and also, I, I think, from Larry. Um, um, there's something in here called the Haley effect. So once Haley makes her opinion known and she's the second girl, the other girls fall in line. Now, when the camera stopped, it's from the Laird News Hour. When the camera stopped, I said to them, and I wish they hadn't stopped rolling, I said to them, what would your parents want you to say? And they all said, oh, bad idea. <laughs> so they know what to say. When you ask a kid, you know, should you wear a bike helmet? They will tell you, yes. But do they wear their bike helmet? No. 
And it might be that they just don't feel it. They don't feel the, th what might happen if their head hits the pavement, which is what you think of, hopefully, when you put your bike helmet on um, or when you are contemplating your bike helmet. Now, I ask you to watch that third girl because what's interesting about her is in response to the question of swimming with sharks, the first words out of her mouth are, I agree with Haley. The answer to her question has nothing to do with sharks. Now, this is filmed in Vermont. Vermont doesn't have a big problem with great white sharks, but they do have a problem with Haley. <laughs> She's probably going to see Haley in the next hour or so, and the odds of seeing a great white shark in the next hour or so are significantly less. So she's making a very smart decision to go with her gut feeling to preserve her social standing. Now she also is interesting because she doesn't think it's a good idea at all. And you can see as her eyes dart around and she actually, she abstracts in front of you. She has a response to this question. Her eyes go all over the place. She's like, well, it could be an interesting idea. <laughs> Which if you don't speak seventh grade girl anymore means, please Haley, don't kill me later. Um, <laughs> That's all that means. Um, but she says, I've heard stories, I've read things about people who've been hurt by sharks. So she's doing that blue square study. She's abstracting. Her frontal lobe is saying to her amygdala very quickly, uh-uh, no, um, don't. You know this. You know you'll be eaten. Don't do it. But she's not quite mature enough yet to override other things that might be entering her mind, like next period, um, when she's going to be alone with Haley, and Haley's going to be like, nice, nice to make me look like an idiot, um, and whatever else happens in eighth grade, um, seventh grade, sorry. So the takeaway from this, um, from this study is when we think about asking our teenagers, you know, what they were thinking, um, the more appropriate question, and again, I wouldn't suggest asking this to a teenager because they will look at you like you have eight heads, um, is, is what, what were you feeling? Um, and so I, I'm giving you that as a substitution, again, not to ask them to directly, but to try to encourage them to really and truly think about consequences in a bodily fashion, in, in a way, like you can ask them, how do you think you would feel if someone did that to you? Um, you they need practice, they need practice. Um, the other thing that, that I think we've overlooked is because, because in adults, because in us, our gut system is so automatic and it's so quick, we assume we've always had it. Just like learning language. Very few of you can tell me how you learned your first language. You don't remember it, but you know you did, and you did it in a fairly short period of time. We learn this stuff during adolescence about safe and not safe, good and wrong, good and bad, all this stuff very quickly, but we don't have a very good memory for it. But we learned it, and it's unique to our culture. So it does take time, and it takes practice in order for the system to be trained up. Now. Um, hopefully, I have a little time to um, go back to the, the Haley question. Now, when we think about teenagers and peers, we often think of really, really fun stuff. Here comes the best part. Actually, watch the two guys. And the audio goes, cool. <laughs> Now, I heard some of you groan, and I assume that's because you've done this. <laughs> Does anyone want to do this? There's, again, there's always a couple of guys. I knew it. There, there's always a couple of grown men. They're like, yeah, <laughs> let's go. Um, and that actually is evolutionarily adaptive. I can't pick on it too much. Um, now, most of you groaned, even though you haven't done this. You don't have to do it because you can abstract about it. You can think about it. And how many, how many people instantly thought of like rolling an ankle? Or breaking a leg, like did you get did you get a physical sensation in your body as you saw that flip happening of like oh no 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 right that's good you're healthy um, now it turns out that teenagers on average are more likely to do these kinds of things when they're around their friends and this is not surprising um, now there's a myth though that I'd like to dispel that parents get broken up with parents get dumped for peers and actually that's just not true. What happens is if you've, ha if you've been in, a, in any remotely healthy kind of situation, after 13 or 14 years, your parents are a known entity. You know their faces, you know their facial expressions, you know what they, what they want you to do, you know a lot about them. You are an expert on your parents. What you don't know is Haley and her friends and the rules of your school. 
Um, you do not get a book before middle school that tells you how to wear your backpack or how to walk or what slang's popular or what clothes to wear. So your overt attention has got to go to your peers. It's survival of the prettiest, basically, um, for a lot of people. You need to learn all kinds of social cues. So your overt attention changes. Parents study, lots of studies show parents still carry the day on major stuff. But on, on the day-to-day -day goings on, peers have to guide you because you're getting ready to become an adult. And you're not going to become an adult with your parents' group. And by becoming an adult, I mean you're eventually going to be trying to find mates. So you don't want to be learning your lessons from your parents' generation. You will not fit in with your own. So it's critically important, and it doesn't mean one instead of the other. It means more overt attention goes to peers. On average, about 299 interactions, almost 300 interactions a day. And if you're a healthy teenager, what do you do as soon as you get home from school? Yeah, call, text, get on, you got to, I mean, you have to get in touch with your friends as soon as you get home. Um, now, how many of you have said or had said to you, what could you possibly have to talk to those people about? You just spent all day with them. Does this sound familiar at all? Okay, now, <clears throat> I have three-year-olds. This started about a year ago. Has anyone ever watched a movie with a two- or a three-year-old? Once? <laughs> Twice? Oh, if someone just went like this, yeah. Um, I could do almost all of the dialogue from the Aristocats for you right now, um, which I will spare you. Um, I also know most of Monsters, Inc. Um, why? I'm like, really? Aristocats again? Really? Are you sure? Because we've watched it three times. Okay. All right. Here we go again. Um, now, it, the reason little kids have to do that is they don't have a two-hour memory span. So every time they see it, they're getting a new movie. They've memorized some pieces, but not the whole thing. So they don't have to work as hard at the pieces they've memorized. They can pay attention to the parts that they don't know. And if you don't believe me, just watch their faces when they watch the movie. Because they'll be, when they get to something they don't, that they have never seen before, their whole facial expression will change. Um, they really are seeing new bits. Now, this happens again in middle school, but this time it's social stuff. But there's no video. There's no replay. The only replay you have is word of mouth. So when you get home, you have to call your best friend. Um, and if you're, if you're female, the conversation generally goes something like, okay, remember today after fourth period when I was like at my locker and I was like standing there and then John came over and he was like, hey, and I was like, hey, and then he said like, all right, I'll see you later. And I said, bye, and then I was like, okay, cool. Did I, did I say like cool or did I say like, oh, cool? I mean, do you think he thought that was okay or should I have said something different? <laughs> And then if you have a good best friend, you'd be like, oh, no, totally. I was talking to Craig, who saw John right after he left the locker. And he was like, oh, my God, she's so cool. Because when I said bye, she said cool, which was really exactly what you should have said. Because his friend Craig said that was definitely the right thing to say. <laughs> OK, so tomorrow when I see him in the morning, like, should I say, like, hey, or should I just like, ignore him? <laughs> oh, God, that's a really good question. I don't know. Maybe you should ignore him. Let's, let's make sure we meet in the morning, because we should definitely go over this again in the morning. <laughs> that's exactly what happens. And you all know this. And we'd like to pretend that only teenagers do it, but you all do post-mortems after dinner parties. <laughs> you do. And wouldn't you love to have a video to be like, no, 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 that's not what she said. Let me back it up. <laughs> See? See? She said, I hate that dessert. Yeah. Um, we rehearse. We practice. We need lots of practice. And teenagers need even more. Now, it teaches them how to walk, how to talk, it teaches you slang. Um, I've kind of already given away where I'm from, but if I told you guys that last night I went to a Wikipissa, does anybody know what I did? A party. Yeah, I went to a party. Um, in, and, and I probably grew up in, in the 80s at some point. So a Wikipissa is an expression that in northern Boston, southern New Hampshire, southern Maine, for a party that's so good apparently you pee in your pants. <laughs> a wicked pisser is actually the literal translation. Um, and I made the mistake of using this example in New Mexico in a group of about 500 people. And when I asked if anyone knew what it meant, there was a like, kind of like stadium seating. This guy way up in the back jumps up and goes, go Sox! <laughs> and I was like, oh God, there's my peer group. <laughs> so your slang that you learn um, helps you find your peer group for your whole life. Um, it geographically and chronologically locks you to a set of people who you should mate with at some point, um, if you'd like. Um, but that's what it's for. Now, how many of you are really awesome at texting? Oh, you're, just, you're not. Stop it. You're not. You're probably good. You're probably good. 
Um, and maybe some of you are very good, but none of you are awesome at it because it's not your language. You're not natives. Um, when I first got my, my first phone, my brother um, lives in Los Angeles. And if you live in Los Angeles, you just inherently know how to text better, like just because you're cooler. So I figured I would just drop all the vowels. And he just didn't respond to me at all. He just called me on the phone. He's like, please don't ever do that again. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, I could just feel you thinking you were cool and you're not. I was like... Our, our, LOL. Um, okay, we don't, we don't speak text. We may know enough text. Now, and this is one of the things that's really important. Parents and people who work with, with young people, we should know some text. We should, be, we should be fairly fluent in it because we should know what's going on. But at some point, it's not our language. At some point, it's unique by design, and it's meant to keep us out, and it should keep us out because there are things about adolescence and the adolescent changes that should be left to the peer group. But you're, I'm glad to see that so many hands went up because you should know the basics. You should know. And you should know who your kids are spending time with. You should know. And you should know basically where they are. But you do not have to know every single nuance. Some of it they have to do on their own and in private in order for them to grow. Um, I wanted to look a little closer at this Haley effect. Um, so I wanted to design a study that looked at sort of social interaction between teenagers. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen an MRI or been in an MRI um, but, you know, the opening opening's about this big. So putting five or six teenagers in there to socialize it doesn't, it's not practical, really. Um, and there are some ethics involved in putting five or six kids in a space. This, anyway, it was funny in my head. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to figure out a way to convince teenagers that they were socially interacting when they were by themselves. And this is one of the greatest things about youth today. They believe they can be online with their friends anywhere at any time. So we came up with a study. We told them we would created a website. And we wanted to see what the teenage brain did when they were just making very, very simple decisions. And we told them, OK, we're going to put you in the magnet. And we're going to ask you to answer some really, really simple questions, just opinion questions. None of them were very emotional. None of them were terribly socially loaded. Um, and we said, but you know, it's kind of hard to be in the MRI with all the noise and be working the keys on this keyboard and stuff. So we want to give you a practice run where you're actually not online. So we'll have you go through first and just do it, just, just give it a practice run. And then what we'll have you do is create a username and a login. And we'll actually log you into the website. Um, and then once you're logged in, um, you will get to see, once you answer, how many people agreed with you. And the other thing our website does is it randomly pulls people's responses and posts them. So you get a sense of what other kids your age are saying. So I need to tell you there's a chance that your answers might be seen by other people your age. That was all we needed to say. None of this was real. This was all completely made up. 100% of our teenagers believed they were online. None of them were. 100% of them believed that one of, at least one of their answers would be shown. None of them were, because these were all preconceived. And when I said to a few of them, I'm like, but they're not even your real names. They're login names. They're like, everybody knows everybody's logins. I mean, it's basically your name. Um, so we had them do these two runs. And the questions were all intermingled between, between the two. So the questions were the same. The only thing that changed between the two runs was the perception that peers might see how you respond. Were there any differences in the brain? Yeah, big ones. Um, the first slide, the first picture over there, is when they thought they were by themselves. We saw a lot of activity in the inferior part of the frontal lobe. And this is actually exactly what adults look like when they're doing the same task. Um, it is an area of the frontal lobe that's known for helping out with just making simple choices. The only thing that changed was the thought that they might be seen by their peers. That's all you have to change, and that spot disappears completely. And instead, you get a big shift to the amygdala and the insula. The areas that cannot or do not seem to switch on to questions like lighting your hair on fire. They have no trouble waking up to Haley might be watching. Now, this is a very important thing to integrate these two pieces of information. Because the same system that doesn't kick in to swimming with sharks kicks in easily in a magnet to a website. You don't even have to be around a person, just the thought of people. So this tells you that peers are having a very direct influence on training up this system. The system responds to peers. And it should. Evolutionarily, that's very adaptive. It makes a lot of sense. It should. Now, one of the things that we do, though, is we talk about peer pressure strictly as a negative thing. 
You know, I don't have a lot of parents say to me, you know, ever since Jamie joined the math team, um, you know, she just hasn't been the same. You know, she's running around with those math fleets and doing quadratic equations and, you know, we don't hear things like that. But you know what? If none of your close friends do hard drugs, guess what? The odds of you going to look for hard drugs are very low. If all of your friends, most of your peer group is going to college, guess where you're going? We don't think about those things. We think about all the bad stuff. When in fact, peers do a lot of really great peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer training. And they have a hold of this system. The system that really forms the gut and, and informs behavior. So we really need to think about how to use that to our advantage when we're working with youth. Because we as adults kind of are outsiders. We're those frontal lobes. Um, but their peers are the survival-related stuff. Um, so we would be wise to, to um, think more about how to be proactive about positive peer pressure, um, which is right here. Um, now, I think, uh, unfortunately, I, have all, I had a whole other section, but I think I'm out of time, if I'm correct. Okay, so um, suffice to say that boys and girls are different, um, and uh, maybe we'll have time for that on the panel, um, and or I'll just have to come back again. Um, thank you very much for your attention. As, as a professor, it's my duty to start the morning with a pop quiz. Um, can any of you think about uh, what this might be? And remember, it's early in the morning, so let's not try to be too vulgar. Um, but uh, two teens looking at each other this way. Can anybody, can anybody just shout out what they think might be, these people might be feeling uh, in parts of their bodies, faces, maybe? <laughs> remember? Lust. Lust. Okay, so what goes with lust? What body states go with lust? How do you know you're feeling lusty? Your palms start sweating, or you're rubbing lotion, either one. Someone's doing that. Yes, your palms do sweat. What else happens? You get butterflies in your stomach. Oh my God, yes. Um, and if you look at the boy's face, you, kinda, you might blush a little, your heart might raise, your breathing might get shallow. Um, oh. Okay, well, <laughs> what would happen if you jumped into your pool and um, saw this guy in terms of body states? This thing, you might get butterflies, we'd call them terror, but um, <laughs> butterflies of sorts. Uh, your palms would sweat and your heart rate would ex increase and your breathing would get shallow and fast. So I'm here today to talk to you about the dangers of dating. Um, <laughs> it's not good, don't do it. Um, no, that's not, that's not exactly it. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about is the fact that those body states are nearly, are nearly identical. And that's not an accident, um, but what happens is your brain actually reads those body states very differently depending on the context in which they occur. So it's, it's, it's a good idea to know um, whether you'd like to approach and kiss someone um, or, or maybe not in, in this case. Um, so what we're talking about is, is emotion and cognition. And emotion literally is feelings, the feelings that you have in your body, your bodily changes. So your stomach getting a little upset, your heart racing, your breathing changing. But your brain needs to interpret those. And that we call cognition, so the thinking portion of your brain. The thinking part of your brain needs to take those signals, interpret them, put them into context, and also figure out what your next move is. Because again, like I said, ideally those signals are gonna give you different information. Now understanding what those signals mean to you um, and when and where and how to act on them, you're not born with, you have to learn. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how you come to learn that. So I think a development is kind of combining these two things. And when you combine um, emotion and cognition, you get cogmotion, which doesn't really make any sense. And then I realized you could actually, it's pretty close to commotion, which it describes adolescence fairly decently. Um, it is not the time of storm and stress that we once thought it was. It is a highly functional period during which a lot of learning takes place, um, but it just happens really quickly and there can be a lot of commotion. So um, let's get started. Um, the three points that I'm gonna try to convince you of um, today, and these are, these are very uh, profound, profound points, um, that a lot of people talk about adolescents not being able to plan ahead and not being able to think about their future. And, and while I agree with this, and I've seen it in action, 
Um, I, I think another way to think about this is actually their inability to, to feel the future, to, to think about what it might actually feel like. Um, and I'm going to try to convince you that we use those body senses to predict our behavior more than we think we do. Um, the second one is probably, the second point probably has never occurred to you before um, and is really profound and that's why I have a PhD because I can think of stuff like this. Um, I'm going to go through it really slowly. The peers matter a lot. Yes, that's what you paid for, Chris. Impulsive. He started drinking, carousing, getting into fights, making uh, poor decisions. Um, and I don't know if this reminds you of any particular group of people, but you might see some similarities um, <laughs> in terms of poor decision making, impulsivity, a um, little bit argumentative at times. Now, there's an important distinction here um, in that Phineas Gage was an adult. And when adults damage their brain, um, sorry to say, but that's pretty much game over. There is, there is, we're learning about increasing amounts of plasticity in the adult brain, but um, it's largely a brain injury. The reason that we see similar behavior in adolescents is a completely different story. It's because they're not done yet, um, which is very, very different than, being, than having a damaged brain. So you can write this down and you can tell everyone you know that you did hear it here, and I think um, Larry will tell you something very similar. Teenagers are not brain damaged. There's no damage. Um, it's a work in progress. It's a learning process. Um, and what our job is, is to be those external frontal lobes until they themselves can use their own frontal lobes to run the show. Now, let's put this all together. Um, this is a human brain. You can tell because our eyeballs in the front. Um, so let's say you were getting ready to come here this morning and um, you went to get your cup of coffee or whatever you have in the morning. And between you and uh, your kitchen counter, you see the rock group kiss. Now, for some of you, this might be a daily occurrence. Um, <laughs> but for some of you, this might actually be a problem. Um, what happens when you see this image is that the visual information goes from your eyes to a relay. And like I said, the amygdala has to check everything to find out if you're in trouble, if you need to act. So it gets a rough copy of what's going on. And it may sound the alarm. Oh crap, Gene Simmons is between me and my coffee again. <laughs> now what it's also doing, while you're preparing your fight stance, because you would all fight him, obviously, um, it sends more detailed information to the visual cortex. So you're getting ready, and you're like, I can't believe I have to do this th again this week. Um, you're getting ready to fight, and in the meantime, the visual system is sending some information up to the frontal lobe, to the controller, to the conductor. And the conductor's saying, hang on, hang on, amygdala, wait a second, wait on that fight or flight, I'm getting some information from visual. You haven't had any coffee, you're exhausted, it's just your kid's poster, take it down a notch. Calm down, never mind. Fight's over. And then you get your coffee and you go on. Now, as I said, I'm sure this is a common occurrence that has happened for a lot of you. Um, or maybe not. Uh, but how many of you have almost been in a car wreck? Almost, but not quite, okay. Now, when you've almost been in a car wreck, do your legs still shake afterwards? You get that shaky feeling and your heart's still racing and stuff? That's because your fight or flight mechanism went off. Adrenaline was released, your muscles got ready, prepared itself, your body prepared itself for injury, but none came. So you, were, you, could, you could easily talk to yourself. How many of you, when that happened, told yourself, okay, I'm really just shaken up because I almost got hurt? okay, this makes sense, my body feels this way because of this circumstance. Well, what if that conductor, that frontal lobe that explained that to you, wasn't completely coordinated yet, wasn't completely experienced yet, and you started having those feelings in your body? It might be kind of hard to interpret them. Um, I'm teaching a senior seminar in adolescent development, uh, the neurophysiology of adolescent development, and one of my students the other day said the most incredibly accurate, simple, Thing. We were actually talking about love during adolescence. And she said, you know, I just, the whole thing from start to finish was just physically uncomfortable. And I was like, what do you, what, what you mean like growing pains? She's like, no, I just, you, you just, there's just so much stuff happening. She's like, I was physically uncomfortable if I was happy. I was physically uncomfortable if I was, okay. All right. So <laughs> there, there you go. Um, 
And then um, a lot of what we call justice is, is, is a little bit juvenile. We may not get to that. And it, there should be a fourth point here, which is another profound point that I'm going to try to uh, make to you today. And this is, this is also equally profound, and I did think of this on my own, um, that boys and girls are actually different. We're going to talk a little bit about that, too. Um, okay. So before we can do this, I want to give you a few, a couple of words on the hardware that we're going to be talking about, um, the human brain. And uh, a lot of people get nervous when they hear about hear human brain, but don't worry, this is relatively painless. Um, it, it'll be actually kind of fun, I promise. Um, now, <clears throat> my second favorite brain structure um, is something called the amygdala. And the amygdala is a Greek, Greek word for almond, and shockingly, the amygdala is the size and shape of an almond. Um, it's down deep in the brain. You have one on each side. It's basically the brain's burglar alarm. It, key, it follows every bit of sensory information that you get, um, and it decides whether or not you need to do something about it. Now, um, the amygdala uh, is in place when you're born. It's what makes you cry when you're wet or hungry. Um, any of you been startled recently and had a noise come out of you that it sounded so weird that you couldn't make if you tried. That's your amygdala. It has a direct connection to your uh, larynx, and it can still make the same cry that you made as a baby, but your larynx isn't the same shape anymore, so it sounds really funny. But that's what this guy does. It's the burglar alarm. Now, this plays into a concept that most of you have heard of called fight or flight, the fight or flight idea. Um, but the amygdala does more than that. It's not simply fight or flight. And the easiest way to remember what it's responsible for in terms of keeping you alive as the burglar alarm are basically four Fs. Um, as we, uh, one, of the, one of them that's not fighting or flighting has to do with feeding, with eating. Food, where food is, remembering what tastes good, what made you sick, what uh, should be avoided, what should be sought after. The amygdala is very, very much a, a part of that. Um, as we talked about, if you need to fight, the amygdala is going to help out um, and get your, get your blood pumping, get your adrenal system going. Um, if you decide not to fight and instead to run, again, the amygdala is going to do this, it, uh, help you with this. One of the things it also does is it has a direct projection to the frontal lobes, which we'll talk about in a minute. It can shut off your thinking. Um, it can shut off your digestion. Because if you're running for your life, um, you don't need those things. It also can shut off ovulation, which should concern you men, because if you're running from a tiger, you can't ovulate. Um, guys, <laughs> think about that one. Um, um, but as, as silly as that might seem, actually when you think about people who are under chronic stress, what, what things get disrupted? Their thinking, often digestive issues, reproductive issues. These aren't, this is, this is, I was gonna say it's not brain science, but it is, actually. Um, and the, uh, the final F, uh, the one that might actually be most important in the long run for keeping us going is, of course, reproduction. Um, so there you have it. This is the amygdala. This is a very primitive, primitive piece of the brain. I'm waiting for a minute on the reproduction thing. A few of you got it, but it's early. Okay, all right, okay. Um, now, you would not want a structure like this running around unsupervised in the human brain. Um, so we have, as its, as its counterpoint, the frontal cortex. Everyone just flipped it. Must, okay, my, all right. So you guys are following along. That's, I've, I, have st I have students who can't do that, so that's very, <laughs> that's really neat to see. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so we have the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex, now again, here's, here, this is why people are afraid of the brain. It's so mystifying. Guess where the frontal cortex is? In the front. <laughs> Go figure. It's right behind your forehead. Um, it's the conductor of the brain. And when I say conductor, it's conducting a pretty big orchestra, which is the rest of the brain. Um, mad, I was physically uncomfortable. If I was in love, I was physically uncomfortable. I was scared. She's like, just the whole thing is just uncomfortable. And I think part of that, what she's talking about, is part of it is getting used to all of these feelings that your brain is starting to recognize, figuring out how to put them into context and how to use them. But that discomfort is what drives you to resolve that discomfort and, and drives you to figure out how to work best in your own environment. Um, but I thought it's a very accurate um, and uh, really, really insightful to remember back to that time when everything just felt kind of squirrely. Um, but it does resolve, and that's the point, you learn. Um, now I want to share the results uh, from a study that were really, really inspiring to me, because I wanted to see how, if and how, this amygdala frontal system might develop. This is a study done by Elizabeth Phelps, who is a fantastic researcher um, at NYU. 
And what she said to people was, this is um, data from MRI, uh, she said to people, she had people come into her laboratory and tape an electrode to their hand. And uh, she had them select a level of shock that was uncomfortable, but not painful. Uncomfortable, but not painful. Now, I assume none of you have ever had a negative run-in with a, a blue square. You have no reason to fear sort of pale blue squares. They don't signify anything in particular to you, right? So she said to them, I'm going to show you hundreds of shapes, all different colors. <clears throat> Anytime you see a blue square, I'm going to shock you. Then she put them in the magnet, and she showed them hundreds of shapes, all different colors, including blue squares. But she did not shock a single person. Nobody was shocked. Then she took them out of the magnet, and she put together all of the moments that the brain was looking at these blue squares, as opposed to all of the other shapes that she told them not to worry about. And when you look at just what was going on during the blue square trials on this side over here, you see these two bright patches. This guy right here is the amygdala. That's the fight or flight response. These folks had a fight or flight response to a blue square, something they never had any experience with harming them before. How is that possible? The amygdala is a very primitive, very basic structure. Well, the frontal lobe told the amygdala to look out for it. So if I told you that behind the screen is a huge, very, very irritated polar bear, most of you would not have to look. There are a couple of guys who would. Um, <laughs> there always are. Um, and we'll get to that part, hopefully, if we have enough time. Um, but most of you would not have to. And some of you might even be afraid. If I gave you the right facial expression and the right tone to my voice, you might have a fight or flight response just from my giving you the information. That's great. That saves your life because you don't have to go see it yourself. Your frontal lobe can tell your amygdala, go, run, fight, flee. It can do that. Um, now, the other piece of brain that got very ex excited next to the amygdala is my, actually my number one favorite part of the brain, um, and it's called the insula. Um, now, before I tell you about the insula, I also want to show you on this half of the screen is what the average of everybody's brain looked like about halfway through the study. And does anyone notice anything different about halfway through the study? The amount of activity really drops, right? So people figured out, oh, we're not getting shocked. But it doesn't go away. It just drops. Now, this to me is proof that humans fundamentally do not trust psychologists. Um, <laughs> So you can be in there, no shocks are being given, but you're still on guard. You are still on guard till the end of the study. But that is a big difference. Now, when we talk about the insula, the insula is really cool. If you could do this, and don't do this, but if you could do this, if you could push your fingers through your ears, don't do this, um, into your brain and keep going through your temporal lobe, you would hit the insula. And in this analogy, the music that's produced by this orchestra is equivalent to your behavior. No behavior happens without a frontal lobe. The frontal lobe coordinates all of your behavior. No behavior gets out of a human being other than reflexes, which are spinal, but no active behavior gets out of a human being without the frontal lobe's involvement. Um, any of you see One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest? Um, a few of you do remember Chief from One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest? Um, a few of you didn't. So <clears throat> any of you who have not seen One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest, just think of any adolescent you know before about seven in the morning. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I can do, actually I can do a quick impression of both for you. So uh, this is a very quick impression of Chief from One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest or any adolescent before seven in the morning. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now that's commonly called a lobotomy. Um, now if someone offers you one, decline. You do not want this. And thankfully, um, the ones that our teenagers have are, are simply functional. They, um, the, it's the last part of the brain to wake up, as you all know, from when you first wake up. You think you're not quite on your toes yet until you've had that cup of coffee, which actually gets blood flowing to that area of the brain. Um, it's hard to behave without a frontal lobe. Now, the frontal lobe waits to develop for very good reasons. Um, it develops last. It's the last piece of brain to develop. And when I say develop, I mean become coordinated. There is a frontal lobe in small children that does stuff. There's a frontal lobe in older children and younger adolescents that does stuff. It just doesn't do adult stuff yet. And that's based largely on the fact that it hasn't had a lot of adult experience yet. The frontal lobe waits to develop because that's where your survival comes in. That's where your culture, your customs, everything that makes you uh, viable in your environment 
is largely based in this part of the brain. So the, the frontal lobe listens to the rest of the pieces of the brain and helps coordinate the behavior that you'd like to do. So going back to this conductor analogy, you can imagine a scenario where uh, the orchestra has been practicing um, Handles water music um, for weeks and is perfect and it's ready to go and the conductor taps the baton and instruments go up and the percussion section decides that it wants to play uh, some earth, wind, and fire instead. How's that going to sound? Not so hot. That's what happens sometimes with young folks, is the conductor, the frontal of the coordinator, isn't quite ready to go yet. And some other piece of brain is like, yeah, that's interesting. I know you want to go over there, but we're going to go over here. Um, and you get, the result is you get undesirable behavior. And sometimes it needs more practice. So um, many of you have heard the story of Phineas Gage, um, who is a railroad worker in Cavendish, Vermont. And he was putting in, uh, he was dynamiting ledge uh, to put in railroad beds and um, a tamping iron, which is about a three foot javelin like thing that they used to place dynamite, somehow sparked. And um, whether it was dynamite or gunpowder, I'm not sure, but actually blew the rod um, under his cheek and out the top of his head. It's illustrated in red there. The rod landed about 30 yards away from him. He didn't fall down, he didn't lose consciousness, he didn't lose his ability to speak. Um, and I grew up in New England, so I feel confident telling you that he probably said something like, geez. <laughs> but I wasn't there, it was the 1800s, I wasn't, I, so I can't say that for sure, but that's probably, anyway. They took him over to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital, and they patched him up, and they sent him home. Now, Gage had been the foreman of his group. He had been a family man. He had been a well-respected guy in town, a nice guy who always showed up for work. And when he came home after his injury, again, all of his, uh, his abilities to speak and function, all the daily living stuff was perfectly intact. But the, treating, the physician who was treating him said Gage was no longer Gage. He just wasn't himself. He began not showing up for appointments. He became impulsive.